Number one gives us two graphs that show models characterized by exponential decay that represent the area covered by two different algae blooms in square yards W weeks after different chemicals were applied. Part A asks us which algae bloom covered a larger area when the chemicals were applied and then asks us how we know. So we want to know which one covers a larger area. So if we look at these two different spots, right, on the initial, because this is um, after zero weeks. So this is the initial. So here our initial coverage is 500, and here our initial coverage is 200 square yards. So I'm just going to say this triangle one covered the larger area, and this is because it covers 500 um, square yards versus the other one covers 200 square yards at the vertical intercept, which we also know is the initial value. Part B says, which algae population is decreasing more rapidly? And explain how you know. So this is when we look at the kind of gap here between these two. So this gap, this vertical gap here, we go from 500 down to maybe like 340. And this one, the vertical gap is much smaller. We're going from 200 to over 100 and 50. Um, so this one is decreasing by like a fourth of its size, where this one is decreasing by more than that. Um, and so I would say, again, that's going to be this like triangle one, because the vertical gap is um, larger. So it's a significantly wider gap here as it goes. And then obviously it gets closer and closer, but this one just doesn't have much of a gap. And you can see after about six years, they're at the same spot. So this, this one started at 200 and gets to about 50 in six weeks, where this one started at 500 and then gets to 50 in six weeks. So this one is dropping significantly faster to be at the same spot after six weeks. Number two, a medicine is applied to a burn on a patient's arm. The area of the burn in square centimeters decreases exponentially and is shown in the graph. What fraction of the burn remains each week? So this is where we want to take the new measurement divided by the original measurement, which I just call the OG measurement. So the new, the new height, so if I'm going to look at these two, I'm just going to look at this one and this one. Okay, any two consecutive ones. So the new one is the six. The original is the eight. So six divided by eight, we could simplify to three fourths. That's how much of the area is remaining each time. Now you could do that between others, right? So you could take other measurements or other dots here. I picked these two um, because they're at exact values, right? If you did six to this one, you're not quite sure where this dot is. Is it four and a half? Is it 4.6, 4.4? So that's why I picked those. Then it says write an equation that represents the area of the burn A after T weeks. Okay, so we have A of T is our function and we're trying to write this. Remember that we'll take the initial value and so our initial value here is eight, right? So we'll take the initial value and we'll multiply that by the fraction of burn that remains. And then our variable will be the exponent. So we have eight times three fourths T. What area of the burn after, what area of the, what is the area of the burn after seven weeks? So now we'll do A of seven into our equation. So we'll do eight times three fourths to the seventh power and we'll type that into our calculator and you get about 1.068 and then this is in square centimeters. So 1.068 remaining. 
Number three, the area of a sheet of paper is 100 square inches. Write an equation that gives the area of the sheet of paper in square inches after being folded in half n times. So here we have a of um, n. So on our function to be capital A, they're folding it n times. So a of n is the function. Okay, we'll have an initial value times the rate of increase or decrease. So in this case, our initial value is 100. And then our paper is being folded in half. So half is one half as a fraction, right? And then to the n power for the number of folds. Part B gives us now the paper is 200 square inches. And then this sheet of paper is being folded into thirds n times. So this time they want our function name to be b. So we'll do b and again folding n times. So b of n is going to be the initial value times the fraction of the paper that's left each time. So our paper started at 200 square centimeters this time. And now we have one third of the size of the paper each time. Are the areas of the two sheets of paper ever the same after being folded n times? So if we take this first one here and we just think about it. So if we take 100 and we fold it in half, the next time it'll be 50, then it'll be 25. If we look at the um, other paper that's being folded in thirds, so 200 divided by three is 66.6 repeating. If we divide that by three again, then we get 22.2 repeating. So we can see that they've never been the same so far. And then if you think about if we cut this in half, um, this paper is now larger and cutting it in half isn't gonna get less than cutting it in thirds, right? So this one is now always smaller. because half is going to be like 12 and a third of this is going to be like seven something. So the purple one's always going to stay larger. So they're never going to be the same. Number four, the graph shows the amount of medicine in two patients after receiving injections. The circles show the medicine in patient A and the triangles show the medicine in patient B. One equation that gives the amount of medicine in milligrams, M, in patient A, which is the circles, um, is this. Okay, so here's the equation for the circles. What could be the equation for the amount of medicine in patient B? So from this original one for A, I see that the initial amount is 300. So I know that this line right here represents 300 which means that this one must be 200 and this one must be 100 for those to have the same scale or for our vertical scale. So then you know that this one is starting at 200, right? So patient B starts at an initial value of 200. So we know that A is wrong and B is wrong because they start at 500. So then we just have to decide if our decay rate is 3 tenths or 7 tenths. So what I'm gonna do is just um, plug in one. So here's one. So I'm just gonna plug in one to this one. And if I do 200 times 3 tenths to the first power, that um, gives me about 60. Well, this number right here where it's at has to be closer to 150. So this one's likely wrong. And if I plug in one here, when I do 200 times 7 tenths to the first, I get 140, which makes more sense for where this triangle is. Okay, that looks like it's more at 140. So that tells me that D is the closest equation. Number five, select all expressions that are equivalent to 3 to the eighth power. So part A, when we multiply powers of the same base, we add those exponents. So 2 plus 4 is 6. So this one is 3 to the 6th. That is not 3 to the 8th. 
For this one, we would add the two and the six and we'd get eight. So this one is three to the eighth power. So that one's good. When you divide powers of the same base, you subtract their exponents. So we'd have 16 minus two, which is 14. So this one would be three to the 14th. So that one's bad. And then here we would have 12 minus four, which is eight. So this one is three to the eighth. That would be good. When you have a power of a power, so we have this parenthesis here, then we multiply the exponents. So we're multiplying four and two together, which gives us eight. So this is three to the eighth. So this one is good. Where this one would be one times seven, which gives us seven. So three to the seventh is not equivalent to three to the eighth. Number six, use a graphing calculator to determine the equation of the line of best fit. Round numbers to two decimal places. So for this one, you're going to need to um, use a graphing calculator or Desmos. So let me get that up here. Okay, so once you have your graphing calculator open, um, then you can... Let me move it over here so I can see the data. So then you can click stat and then edit. So you're going to edit your lists. So if you have any information in here, you want to go up to the L1, hit clear, and then arrow back down and it'll clear out that data. So then we'll just type in our numbers. Okay, so you'll type your X's into list one and you'll type your Y's into list two, and then you wanna be careful, so you wanna recheck and make sure you got everything typed in correctly. So then list two, we'll type in those Y's. Then once you have your data in your lists, then you're gonna click stat again. This time you're gonna arrow over to the calculate menu and you wanna pick number four, which is the linear regression model. That's your line of best fit. So you can either arrow down to it and hit enter, or you can just click the number four. Might ask you some questions here of what do you want your list one to be, your list two to be, you can just leave it, okay, for your X and your Y. Then hit calculate, and it'll give you this information. So let me screenshot this and bring it with me over to here. So this is what you want to fill in for your line of best fit. So as you're looking at this, we see this here that says y equals ax plus b. So you have y equals ax plus your b um, value. And then they give you the, the a and the b, right? So right here, it gives you your a value. And what did it want? Two decimal places. So here's your A value. So that goes in front of the X, 1.18, negative 1.18. And then your B value is this 37.636. So plus 37.64 if we're rounding to two decimal places. So then that's your line of best fit.